I want to talk to you today about how to sin less than you do. How to sin less than you do. Would you like to sin less than you do? It occurs to me that there are two kinds of people that this conversation would not be interesting to me, to you. And uh, I would encourage you to start your lesson by talking about that. Who would not be interested in sinning less than you do? And it occurs to me there's two kinds of people. The first kind of person is the person who says, well, this is just not a big problem to me. We're going to talk to be, uh, today about thou shall not commit adultery. And somebody's sitting in the room saying, you know what? That's just not a problem for me. This is an irrelevant lesson for me. And uh, if you're thinking that, I want to encourage you to think about the scripture that says, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. If you think that you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And the first step to conquering any sin is realizing it could happen to me. A lot of talk about racism in our day, particularly as, as I'm recording this. A lot of talk about racism. And the first step in curing racism from your heart is to realize that it, it just might be true of you. You just might be a racist. Almost all of us, I would say all of us, are racist to some degree. And it starts, curing racism starts by saying, search me, O God, and show me that part of my heart that is r- racist. It starts by saying, I am capable of, of sin. You who think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't. You don't sin. Another category of people who might think this is not that interesting is, is those who would say sin is not that bad. It's not that bad. You know, a little bit of sin doesn't, doesn't hurt anybody. I actually read a book years ago that said that, that, that we, ought to, we ought to not be immoral, but don't, don't try too hard uh, to, to be a good person, essentially was what the, what the book was saying. And that is not what the scripture says. The Bible says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Sin is always the stuff that will mess up your, your, your life. And so uh, all of us ought to be deeply interested in the topic, how to sin less than you do. So our key verse is Exodus 20, 14, you shall not commit adultery. And you might spend a little time talking about why does this happen? Uh, Spend a little time brainstorming about famous preachers and famous politicians and famous people you have known whose life has been harmed because they committed adultery. And by the way, I would encourage you to use that language. Don't talk about an affair. Don't talk about an indiscretion. Talk about a sin. Talk about committing adultery. And we want to talk about perhaps the most famous example in all scripture, and that is David committing adultery with Bathsheba. So here's our fat passage. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab. And I would encourage you to read the scripture and just ask, what do we learn about committing adultery from that line right there? In the spring of the year, at the times when kings go forth to war, go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged the Rabbah. And notice the writer emphasizes the point, but David remained in Jerusalem. In a sense, he's saying, listen to this, pay attention to this. One evening, got up, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of, of the palace. From there, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And I ask you the question, what do we learn about sinning less than we do uh, from that part of the passage right there? And just encourage the people just to think about that a little bit. Then David sent a messenger to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived, sent word to David and said, I am pregnant. And I ask again, how does this happen? And I would encourage you to ask your people, read this text and ask, how does this happen? How does it happen that a man and woman can stand before God and all their friends and say, for the rest of your life, I promise to love you. I promise to be true and faithful to you. And yet it happens over and over and over again. You've seen it in your life. I've seen it in in my life. It happens all all the time. They end up in the arms of of somebody else. And I would encourage you to get your people to read this text and and then ask what they decide discover they will tend to learn and ask the question, what do we learn about committing adultery from this passage? And this is the first thing I learned. And that is it happened when David lollygagged when he should have gone out to war. He lollygagged when he should have gone out to war in the spring of the year, when the time Kings go off to war, David sent Joab with him. And then down at the end of that, that verse, but David remained in Jerusalem and he's emphasizing the point. The writer is emphasizing the point that if David had been where he should have been, he wouldn't been tempted like he was tempted and his whole, the whole trajectory of his life would have been different uh, because of this. 
One of the key passages on this is 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that says, No temptation has take, overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I've read that to my people at times and actually misquoted it and said, And when you are tempted, he will provide a way for to make you really, really strong so that you can endure the temptation. Is that what the scripture says? No, he will provide a way out. This is the big idea. If you can avoid the temptation, you can avoid the sin. And if you want to sin less than you do, don't do what David did. Don't stay home when you ought to be going, going off to war. The key to sinning less than you do is not trying really hard not to sin as much it is, as it is finding the way out. If you can avoid the temptation, you can avoid the sin. I've got a video in your PowerPoint that you may or may not want to use. Let me give you a quote from Jerome. Engage in some occupation so that the devil may always find you busy. I love that little poem that goes, I walked down the street and I fell in a hole. And boy, I hate falling in a hole. It was awful down in that hole. The next day I said to myself, I'm going to try really hard not to, not to fall in that hole. I walked down the street and I fell in the hole. And I hate falling in the hole. And I, scrapped and I scraped and I tried and I clawed. And I got myself out of the hole. And I said to myself, I will not fall in that hole again. And so the next day I walked down the opposite side of the, the, the street. And I thought to myself, boy, I'm just going to go walk across the street and look in that hole. And then I fell in the hole. And uh, I scraped and I uh, scraped and I got got it, climbed on a clawed and I got out of that hole and I said to myself, man, I hate, I hate, I hate climbing down in that hole. The next day I didn't fall in the hole. And the reason was I fell down, I walked down a different street. And if you walk down a different street, you will not fall in the hole. I love this rule. I've heard Andy Stanley say, and, and truth be told, I've heard a number of preachers say it and every preacher ought to adopt this and every Christian ought to adopt this, what I call the Andy Stanley rule. It could be called the Billy Graham rule or a lot of other people rule because a lot of people have, have adopted this, but not enough. And and that's why we hear of a affair from time to time. But the rule goes like this, and you've heard me say it, say it before, and you ought to say it to your people and say it, say it often. I don't go to lunch with a woman. I don't share a meal with a woman. I don't counsel a woman alone. I don't talk to a woman about anything really personal, uh, even in, in, in public. I am never alone with a woman, and if you will do that, you will never be tempted. And uh, if David had done that, if David had stayed far, far, far away, how his life would, would, would have been di different. So it happened to David because David lollygagged when he should have gone out to war. and happened secondly because David lingered when he should have fled. Now I'm reading into the text just a little bit here, but here's our verse, 2 Samuel 11, 2. One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From there he saw, and I am picturing he saw, and he looked, and he continued to look. He saw a woman bathing. The woman was very, very beautiful. And what should he have done at this point? He should have fled. He should have ran. There's a lot we don't know about this story number of questions I have. Did he plan to see her? Had he seen her before? How long did he stare? I think he very well might have planned to see her. I think he very well might have seen he, her before. Life is often a matter of patterns. Uh, did she knew, know that he was looking? If I was taking a bath somewhere, I'd know, I'd look around and see that I, that I had some, some privacy. And I have a feeling that she knew that he could see her. Uh, I don't know that for sure. It's something, something we don't know. And it raises the question to what degree she is complicit. So there's a number of questions we'd, we'd have have about this. I encourage you to discuss that with, with, with your, your group. There's a lot we don't know, but here's what we do know. The Bible says flee sexual immorality. It does not say try really hard not to sin. It says flee sexual immorality. Run. First time you are tempted. First time you are tempted. We ought to flee sexual immorality. First Timothy 6.11 says, but you man of God flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And by the way, you see in that verse an example of the idea of the principle of replacement that we we flee evil and we pursue godliness. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee the evil desires of the youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a, a pure heart. So here's the big idea. The first exit is the easiest exit. The first exit, the first time temptation comes. I just say to myself, I'm capable of sin. I'm capable of sin. and I don't want to sin. And so I want to take the first possible exit. So what have we learned so far? What have we learned so far? And I want to encourage you to, ask, to talk about these two things. And if you could get these two things down, you'd go a long way towards sinning less, less than you do. And what have we learned so far about sinning less than, you, less than you do? David lollygagged when he should have gone to war and he lingered when he should have fled. It happened, adultery happened when David didn't listen to the counsel of his, his friend. And again, I'm reading just a, a bit into the text, but to, in verse three, we read, David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she's Bath Bathsheba, the daughter. This is someone's daughter, David. David, it's someone's daughter. It's someone is in, who is in relationship. It's someone that whose heart 
some uh, daddy whose heart will be broken when, when this happened. It is a daughter of Eliam and it's a wife, David. This is a man that somebody, this is a woman, excuse me, that somebody loves. This is somebody's wife, David. And I, I sense that this man was hinting to David, but David did not take the hint. There's a gazillion verses on this in Proverbs. One says, Proverbs 15, 22, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they, they succeed. And one of the keys to success in life is to have many advisors. And one of the keys to keeping yourself from sin is to surround yourself with good friends who will say, you know what? You're going astray here. You're going astray here. You need to be careful here. You need to be careful in that relationship. I wouldn't do that anymore. I wouldn't spend any time uh, w- w- with her. It looks like a relationship was de- developing here and we needed to develop some friends and we need to let our friends speak into our life. So what have we learned so far? We've learned three things so far. Can you you recall them? And people will recall when you ask them to recall. The first thing we learned is David lollygagged when he should have gone to war. He lingered when he should have fled. He did not listen to the counsel of his friends. And the last thing I, I observed does not come from the text so much as it comes from what the text does not say. And that is that David didn't use God's number one weapon against temptation. He didn't use God, God's number one weapon against temptation. We don't know who wrote Psalm 119, 11. David may have written it himself. We're not really sure. Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Would you like to sin less than you do? What does this verse teach us about sinning less than you do? If you want to sin less than you do, you want to hide God's word in your heart. You want to memorize God's word. And I would encourage you to turn to Matthew 4 and look at that temptation story of Jesus. And we look at the first temptation of Jesus and how did Jesus deal with that temptation? Matthew 4, 4 says, Jesus answers, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. How did Jesus deal with that first temptation? And that is he used memorized scripture and Satan came to him with a second temptation and Jesus answered him. It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And the second time Jesus was tempted and Jesus dealt with the temptation temptation with memorized scripture. And Satan came to a third time with a third temptation. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And a third time, Jesus dealt with temptation with, with memorized scripture. And here is my question to you. If Jesus used memorized scripture three out of three times to deal with temptation, what hope do you have if you have not hidden God's word in your heart? And if you want to sin less than you do, I would encourage you to embrace God's God-given weapon for dealing with sin, and that is memorized scripture. One other observation from the story, not really from this story itself, as so much as the st- overall story of, of David, and that, and that is this. David spent the rest of his life living with the consequences. David spent the rest of his life living with the consequences. And uh, you might spend a little time talking about what the rest of David's life was like and how he spent the rest of his life living with the consequences. 2 Samuel 12, 10 says, Now for, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hitt- Hittite to be your own. And God will forgive sin, but you will spend the rest of your life with the consequences of your sin. Hebrews 11.25 says he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Sin is pleasurable, but it is only pleasurable for a short season. And Satan will tend to magnify the pleasure of sin and minimize the consequences. And if you want to sin less than you do, think soberly about the consequences of sin and minimize in your mind the short-term nature of the sin. And may God richly bless you as you teach your people to sin less than they do.